we've accelerated deep learning by a million times, which is the reason why it's now possible for us to create these large language models. A million times speed up, a million times reduction in cost and energy is what made it possible for us to make uh, general, generative AI possible. And so I made a cartoon for you. I made a cartoon for you of our journey. Did you make and it or did generative AI? I had it made. <laughs> I had it made. That's what CEOs do. We don't do anything. We just have it be done. <laughs> and so this, is, this cartoon here is really terrific. So these are some of the most important moments in the computer industry. The IBM System 360, of course, the invention of modern computing, the teapot, 1975, the Utah teapot, 1979, ray tracing, 1986, programmable shading. Of course, most of the animated movies that we see today wouldn't be possible if not for programmable shading, originally done on the Cray supercomputer. And then in 1993, NVIDIA was founded. Chris Curtis and I founded the company. Uh, 1995, Windows PC revolutionized the personal computer industry, put a personal computer in every home, at every desk. 2001, we invented the first programmable shading GPU. And that, that really drove a uh, vast majority of NVIDIA's journey up to that point. But at the background of everything we were doing was accelerated computing so that you can solve problems that normal computers can't. And the application we chose first was computer graphics. And it was probably one of the best decisions we ever made because computer graphics was insanely computationally in intensive and remained so for the entire 31 years that, that uh, NVIDIA has been here. It was also incredibly high volume because we applied computer graphics to an application at the time that wasn't mainstream, 3D graphics video games. The combination of very large volume, very complicated computing problem led to a very large R&D budget for us, which drove the flywheel of our company. One day in 2012, we made our first contact, you know, Star Trek first contact with artificial intelligence. That first contact was AlexNet. Mm -hmm. It was in 2012, very big moment. We made the observation that AlexNet was an incredible breakthrough in computer vision, but at the core of it, that it was a new way of writing software. Instead of engineers given input, imagining what the output was going to be, write algorithms, we now have a computer that given input and example outputs would figure out what the program is in the middle. That observation and that we can use this technique to solve a whole bunch of problems that previously wasn't solvable was a great observation. And we changed everything in our company to pursue it from the processor to the systems to the software stack, all the algorithms, NVIDIA basic research pivoted towards working on deep learning. And so in 2016, we introduced the first computer we built for deep learning and we called it DGX1. And I delivered the first DGX1 outside of our company. I built it for NVIDIA to build models for self-driving cars and robotics and such and, and generative AI for graphics. Somebody saw uh, an example of DGX1. Elon reached out to me and said, hey, I would love to have one of those for a startup company we're starting. And so I delivered the first one to a company at the time uh, that knew, nobody knew about called OpenAI. And so that was 2016. 2017 was the transformer that revolutionized modern machine learning, mo modern deep learning. In 2018, right here at SIGGRAPH, we announced RTX, the world's first real-time interactive ray tracer, ray tracing platform, we call it RTX. It was such a big deal that we changed the name of GTX, which everybody referred to our graphics cards as, to RTX. And you mentioned last year yep. during your SIGGRAPH keynote yep. that RTX, Ray Tracing Extreme, yep. was one of the big important moments when computer graphics met AI. That's right. But that had yeah. been happening for a while, actually. So what was so important about RTX in 2018? We made it possible to use a parallel processor to accelerate ray tracing. Um, but even then, we were ray tracing at about five frames every second, depending on, on how many rays we're talking about tracing. And we were doing it at 1080 resolution. Uh, obviously, video games need a lot more than that. Mm -hmm. Obviously, real-time graphics mm -hmm. need more than that. And, and, and so we this needed, crowd definitely knows what that means. But for the folks who are yeah. watching online, the rendering processes used to take a really long time when you were making something It animated. used to take a 
Cray supercomputer to render right. just a few pixels. Right. And now we have our RTX to accelerate that tr ray tracing. But it was interactive. It was real time, but it wasn't fast enough to be a video game. And so uh, we realized that we needed a big boost, probably something along the lines of 20x or so, maybe 50x or so boost. And the team uh, invented DLSS, which basically renders one pixel while it uses AI to infer a whole bunch of other pixels. And so you, we basically taught an AI that is conditioned on what it saw and then fills in the dots for everything else. Mm -hmm. And now we're able to render fully ray trace, fully path trace simulations at 4K resolution at 300 frames per second made possible by, by AI. And so 2018 came along, 2022, as we all know, ChatGPT came out, fastest growing service in history. Just about every industry is going to be affected by this, whether it's scientific computing, trying to do a better job uh, predicting the weather with uh, a lot less energy, and very importantly, robotics, self-driving cars are all going to be transformed mm -hmm. by generative AI. I've gotten the sense from talking to you recently that you are optimistic that this, these generative AI tools will become more controllable. Yeah. more accurate. We all know that there are issues with hallucinations, low quality outputs, that people are using these tools and they're maybe not getting exactly the output that they're hoping for. Right. Meanwhile, they're using a lot of energy, which we're going to talk about. Why are you so optimistic about this? What, is, what do you think is pointing us in the direction of this generative AI actually becoming that much more useful and controllable? The big breakthrough of ChatGPT was reinforcement learning human feedback which was the way of using humans to align the AI on our core values or align our AI on the skills that we would like it to perform. Other breakthroughs have arrived since then. Guard railing, which causes the AI to focus its energy or focus its response in a particular domain so that it doesn't wander off and pontificate about all kinds of stuff that you ask it about. It would only focus on the things that it's been trained to do, aligned to perform, and it has deep knowledge in. The third breakthrough is called retrieval augmented generation, which mm -hmm. basically is data that has been embedded so that we understand the meaning of that data. Mm -hmm. And so it's a more authoritative data set. It goes a, beyond just right. the trained data set. For example, it might be all of the articles that you've ever written, all of the papers that you've ever written. And it could be essentially a, a chatbot of you. So everything that I've ever written or ever said could be vectorized and then created into a semantic database. And then before an AI responds, it would search the appropriate content from that vector database and then augment it in its gener generative process. And you think that is one of the most important factors? These and three combinations really made it possible for us to do that with text. Now, the, the thing that's really cool is that we are now starting to figure out how to do that with, with images, visuals. right? And so if you look at today's generative AI, in this particular case, this is a Edify model that NVIDIA created. It's a 2D, text-to-2D foundation model. It's multimodal. And we used, we partnered with Getty to use their library of data to train an AI model. And so this is a, a text to uh, 2D image. Mm -hmm. and you it, also created this slide personally, right? I, I, had, I personally had this slide created. And so <clears throat> here's a prompt. And this could be a prompt for somebody who owns a brand. In this case, Coca-Cola. It could be a car. It could be a luxury product. It could be anything. You use the prompt and generate the image. However, it's hard to control this prompt. And it may hallucinate. It may create it in such a way that it's not exactly what you want. And to fine-tune this using words is really hard because it's very imprecise. And so the ability for us to now control that image is difficult to do. And so we've created a way that allows us to control and align that with more conditioning. And so the way you do that is we create another model. And it's Edify 3D, one of our foundation models. We've created this AI foundry where partners can come and work with us. And we create the model for them with their data. We invent the model. And they bring their data. And we uh, create a model that they can take with them. Is it so only using their data? Only uses their data. So this only uses all of the data that's available on Shutterstock that they have, have the rights to, to use to train. And so we now use Prompt Generator 3D. We put that in a place where you could compose data and content 
from a lot of different modalities. It could be 3D, it could be AI, it could be uh, animation, it could be materials. And so we use Omniverse to compose all of these multimodality data, and now you can control it. You could change the pose, you could change the placement, you could change whatever you like. And then you take what comes out of Omniverse, you now augment it with the prompt. It's a little bit like retrieval augmented generation. This is now 3D augmented generation. The edified model is multimodal, so it understands the image, understands the prompt, and it uses it in combination to create a new image. So now this is a controlled image. We can generate images exactly the way we like it. Just now I showed you Omniverse augmented generation for images. This is a RAG, this is a uh, retrieval augmented generative AI. And we've created this digital human front end, basically the IO of an AI that has the ability to speak, make eye contact with you, anim animate in an empathetic way. You could decide to ch connect your ChatGPT or your AI to the digital human, or you could connect your digital human to our retrieval augmented generation this breakthrough is really quite incredible, and it makes it possible for us. Amazing graphics researchers, welcome to SIGGRAPH 2024. So it makes it possible to animate using an AI. You, you chat with the AI, it generates text, that text then is translated to sound, text to speech. That speech, the sound, then animates the face, and then RTX path tracing does the rendering of the digital human. What I hear you talking a lot about today these are software developments, right? They're relying on your GPUs, but ultimately, this is software. This is NVIDIA going further up the stack. Meanwhile, there are some companies, some folks in the generative AI space who are in software and cloud services, but they're looking to go further down the stack, right? They might be developing their own chips or TPUs that are competitive with what you are doing. How crucial is this software strategy to NVIDIA maintaining its lead and actually fulfilling some of these promises of growth that people are looking at for NVIDIA right now? We've always been a software company and even first. And the reason for that is because accelerated computing is not general purpose computing. General purpose computing can take any program, Python, and just run it. And almost everybody's uh, program can be compiled to run effectively. Unfortunately, when you want to accelerate fluid dynamics, you have to understand the, the algorithms of fluid dynamics so that you could uh, refactor it in such a way that it could be accelerated. And you have to design an accelerator, you have to design the CUDA GPU, so that it understands the algorithms so that it could do a good job accelerating it. And the benefit, of course, by redesigning the whole stack, we can accelerate applications 20, 40, 50 times, 100 times over general purpose computing. In the case of deep learning, over the course of the last 10 to 12 years or so, we've accelerated deep learning by a million times, which is the reason why it's now possible for us to create these large language models. A million times speed up, a million times reduction in cost and energy is what made it possible for us to make a general, generative AI possible. But that's designing a new processor, a new system, the Tensor Core GPUs, the NVLink switch fabric, is completely groundbreaking for AI. And you, if you don't understand the algorithms, the, the applications above it, it's really hard to figure out how to design that whole stack. What is the most important part of NVIDIA's software ecosystem for NVIDIA's future? It takes a new library. We call it DSLs, domain-specific library. In generative AI, that DSL is called QDNN. Uh, for SQL processing data frames, it's called QDF. We got a whole bunch of coups. Every time we introduce a domain-specific library, it exposes accelerated computing to a new market. But notice every single time we want to open up a new market, like QDF, in order to do data processing. Data processing is probably, what, a third of the world's computing? Every company does data processing. And most companies' data is in data frames, in tabular format. And so in order to create an acceleration library for tabular formats was insanely hard because what's inside those tables could be floating point numbers, 64-bit integers, it could be letters and all kinds of stuff. And so we have to figure out a way to go compute all that. Every single time we open up a new market, it just requires us to reinvent everything of that computing. That's the reason why we're working on robotics. That's the reason why we're working on aut autonomous vehicles, to understand the algorithms that's necessary to open up that market and to understand the computing layer underneath it so that we can deliver extraordinary results. And so there's nothing easy about it. 
Generative AI takes up a lot of energy. I'm just saying, my job's super hard. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Let's talk about energy. Yeah. <laughs> Generative AI, incredibly energy intensive. Yep. I am going to read from my note cards here. According to some research, ChatGPT, a single query, takes up nearly 10 times the electricity to process a single Google search. Data centers consume 1% to 2% of overall worldwide energy, but some say that it could be as much as 3 to 4%. Some say as much as 6% by the end of the decade. Data center workloads tripled between 2015 and 2019. That was only 2019. AI, generative AI, is taking up a large portion of all of that. Is there going to be enough energy to fulfill the demand of what you want to build and do? Yes. And um, a couple of observations. So first, there are, there are three or four model makers that are pushing to frontier a couple of years ago. There, there are probably three times that many this year that are pushing the frontiers of, of models. And the size of the models are, call it uh, twice as large every year. And in order to train a model that's twice as large, you need more than twice as much data. And so the computational load is growing call it a factor of four each year, just for simple thinking. Now, that's one of the reasons why Blackwell is so highly anticipated, because we accelerated the application so much using the same amount of energy. And so this is an example of accelerating applications at constant energy, constant cost. You're making it cheaper and cheaper. Now, the important thing, though, is I've only highlighted 10 companies. The world has tons of companies. NVIDIA is selling GPUs to a whole lot of companies and a whole lot of different data centers. And so the question is, what's happening? At the core, the first thing that's actually happening is the end of CPU scaling and the beginning of accelerated computing. Text completion, speech recognition, recommender systems that are used in data centers all over the world. Everyone is moving from CPUs to accelerated computing because uh, they want to save energy. Accelerated computing helps you save so much energy, 20 times, 50 times, and doing the same processing. Generative AI is probably consuming, let's pick a very large number, probably a 1% or so of the world's energy. But remember, even if the data centers uh, consume 4% of the world, the goal of generative AI is not training. The goal of generative AI is inference. And the inference, ideally, we create new models for predicting weather, predicting new materials, allow us to optimize our supply chain, reduce the amount of energy consumed and wasted gasoline as we deliver products. And so the goal is actually to reduce the energy consumed of the 96%. The second thing, the, the, the next thing that I'll say about generative AI is remember, in the, the traditional way of doing computing is called retrieval-based computing. Everything is pre-recorded. All the stories are written pre-recorded, all the images are pre-recorded, all the videos are pre-recorded. Everything is stored off in a data center somewhere, pre-recorded. Generative AI reduces the amount of energy necessary to go run to a data center over the network, re retrieve something, and bring it over the network. Don't forget, 60% of the energy is consumed on the internet, moving the electrons around, moving the bits and bytes around. Mm -hmm. And so generative AI is gonna reduce the amount of energy on the internet because instead of having to go retrieve the information, we can generate it right there on the spot because we understand the context. We probably have some uh, content already on the device and we can generate the response so that you don't have to go retrieve it. AI doesn't care where it goes to school. Today's data centers are built near the power grid where society is, of course, because that's where we need it. In the future, you're going to see data centers being built in different parts of the world where there's excess energy it's just that it costs a lot of money to bring that energy to society. Maybe it's in a desert, maybe it's in places that has a lot of sustainable energy. We can put data centers where there's less population and more energy. There's a lot of energy in the world, and what we need to do is move data centers out closer to where there's excess energy and not put everything near population. AI doesn't care where it's trained. Part I'd never heard that phrase before. AI doesn't care where it goes to school, and that's interesting. Yeah, it's true. I'm going to think on that. Generative AI is going to increase productivity. It's going to enable us to discover new science, make things more energy efficient. So that also, accelerated so, computing... The lights just came on because what, what, we were talking about energy, and all of a sudden it's like the Earth was like... <laughs> okay. <laughs> Jensen, thank you so much. I think we're probably going to get kicked off stage soon. Thank you, everybody. We'll be right back.